Part of the interruption, I'm Chris Garrett, joined one last time by Amy Poppinga and Sam Mulberry. Uh, guys, this is our seventh and last webisode of the, this. Is actually our eighth time doing Summer CWC. So this is so it's actually like our fifty sixth webisode. Wow! If Are we ready for go back, If they want to go back and watch the full yeah. catalog, these all exist. It's very bittersweet. <laughs> It is. I'm actually in a very good mood. You can tell this is opening day for baseball, so yeah. I'm, I'm ready to move on. I like. I'll. Oh. I'm, I'm. I've enjoyed CWC, but it's time for baseball to finally start. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to wrap up Unit Three. So just actually a few days ago, we talked about the scientific revolution. We started talking about the Enlightenment, and then in our last uh, second half of the unit, we talked more about the Enlightenment. Amy, last time, we asked you to praise the Enlightenment. Today, let's turn around. What troubles you about that era? Yeah, well, I think that, um, and again, students, surprise, surprise, thinking about it through the lens of our current context, um, I feel like a lot of um, what is problematic about the Enlightenment is we, um, and we, we've done this throughout our time in CWC, is to ask, well, you know, whoever, we have to isolate, like who has power, who has a voice, and then ultimately how are the people in those positions of power who have a mechanism for either, um, you know, like, Voicing whether it whether it comes to like how we're thinking about theology, whether it comes to think political structures, um, uh, hierarchical structures within the society, those become solidified um, and set a norm, and then those that don't fit into that particular category um, are then sort of living um, in reaction to and living underneath those systems as they get defined. And to me, that's where we have to really look at the Enlightenment. And we um, something I appreciate is that. Um, the, the enlightenment to me more so than the other time periods we study is where, you know, we really look at some of the foundational pieces of writing that we still currently, we use this language all the time. Like we use language around equality. We, um, there's, there's, you know, I mean, I feel like we should just have a class called like, you know, founding fathers, things they said, things they didn't, and what the things they said actually meant when they said them and what do they mean now, right? Because um, we we use language and we do make it universal. Um, and we say, well, we just need to, and, and I think that's an interesting question because then we also sort of apply that to scripture, right? Like, um, okay, well, this was said, what, what attention do we pay to context or do we not pay attention to context and say, well, I'm gonna interpret that in a much more inclusive way for what that should mean now. And um, I think that to me is um, such a tricky question in the enlightenment because, on the one hand, there's so much to admire about the the notion of how virtue gets defined. How do we think about um, education? What do we think about what education does for people? But we really have to ask these questions about access, and um, and so we were, you know, like like we've said to you as students. Everything from the Enlightenment should feel super familiar because um, while we are offering critiques, we still live within this system. So I mean, it's like, well, um, what do we think about capitalism, and what do you know? What do we think about how what capitalism was supposed to be on paper? How has capitalism played out? How has it played out at a global level? But then really bring it down to the um, community level. So um, I think the Enlightenment is a time period that we really need to problematize mostly because we still we still live in it so I think that um you know and I guess I I just want to say because I do think that um also it, it doesn't mean when we stop I mean I know we say this but when we stop and critique things it doesn't mean that we um you know are saying well then throw it all out that's hmm. that's not what it is it's about saying we we live in this space and thus we have an obligation to try to work with what exists and to try to make things better and to not sort of sit back and be like, well, our documents say, you know, all people are created equal. They don't actually say people. So, I mean, um, to me, uh, what I like about breaking things down historically is that hopefully by the time we get to the enlightenment, we're like ready to do that more rigorous work of saying um, we can critique, but that doesn't mean throwing everything out. Um, so, I mean, earlier in history, CWC used to spend a lot of time on the 19th and 20th centuries. That's not emphasized as much in our like in the current gen ed curriculum, but we do close with a glance at that time period. You know, Sam, what are you most happy that we 
brought back from the 19th or 20th century that we pulled out of the closet and said, let's try that in a new place. You know, it's interesting. It, it plays a little bit into what you're talking about uh, in terms of we get to this sort of peak of the Enlightenment. And if we go further into the 19th and 20th century, we get to see both critiques of the Enlightenment, but also like um, the Enlightenment kind of the logic of the Enlightenment playing itself out to some some more kind of extreme positions that then people need to wrestle with. So, uh, one of my favorite lectures as a, as a T, when I was a TA in the late '90s in CWC, Barrett Fisher gave a lecture um, where he talked about Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, and he used it as a way to understand four major 19th century figures: Marx, Darwin, Nietzsche, and Freud. Um, and and as a way to say like these are people who are children of the sort of age of reason enlightenment but are pushing that line of thinking to almost to its logical extent and then it all but in doing that it almost turns itself back in on some of those enlightenment values and questions some of those enlightenment values so i like the fact that going into the 19th century we get that and then going into the 20th century um we get to talk about i think one of the other big places where we see the enlightenment and this scientific revolution pushed into absurdity kind of and that is the world wars so in the in the museum you know we had that uh, world war one memorial and that was that's important to chris and i because we taught a travel course where we were in europe taking students to some of these first world war memorials but i think being able to realize that uh, the Enlightenment leads to some of these other things, this focus on reason and science, and that that can also become deeply dehumanizing on a broad scale in that way, too. So I think getting some of that stuff back um, helps to make it. F There's always this danger when you end in the year 1800 that it feels like, oh, we hit the Enlightenment great yeah. like and, and it's like yeah but there's a reason as much as is amy saying like we still kind of live in the age of enlightenment there's a, we also live in a world that wouldn't acknowledge this as the age of enlightenment we would be like yeah, there's a lot of problems with that and it's because we've had the 19th and especially the 20th century to poke major holes in that even that the idea of progress and things like that that maybe that's way more of a mixed bag than someone in 1770 would have said um, so this sort of leads to the fact that, um, you know, we talk about CWC ending in uh, face to face CWC ending in 1800. And that's because there's another course that comes after that, which is the L course, which is like our um, our modern age kind of course. So it's sort of looking at the last um, two centuries or so and picking up that narrative and mostly picking up the the themes coming out of a course like CWC and and, and interrogating that. So Chris, can you tell us, you teach L courses, can you tell us a little bit about L courses and how they build off of CWC? Because students taking this course are likely, that's gonna be something they're gonna enroll in maybe even this fall. Right, so L courses um, are basically 19th and 20th century, still kind of Western culture classes, but much more focused on American history. And at least as I teach them, really focused on the 20th century. So it's, it is it is a kind of sequel to CWC. And uh, you know, Sam mentioned we've taught a World War I travel course that has an L take. Uh, next spring, I'm teaching a World War II on-campus class that has an L take. And then this past spring, uh, I taught for the first time a class on the history and politics of sports with Chris Moore in the political science department. So those are my three LTA courses. But you can find them in lots of different departments, not just history and political science, but uh, philosophy has a couple of LTAGs. Uh, for a long time, there's an economics course that was LTAG. There's a theater course that's LTAG. English has LTAG. So you have some more choice here, students, as you get into that category. Um, I really like them because I really like CWC. and. Uh, I, mean, I find myself asking some of the same questions in L courses that we ask in CWC. The difference is it's now much more familiar, right? There, there's, I hope you get the sense of CWC is like, at the beginning of it, it's kind of like distantly familiar. And then as you get closer to your own time and we get closer to the American story as we think of it, it, it starts to, it starts to become sharper image. And once you get to 20th century American history, like it's really entering like your family story or Bethel's story or the Minnesota story, like it really becomes familiar. So we've, we've talked a little bit about war already. So I'll just mention a couple of ways it shows up in the sports class we taught last spring. 
Yeah, like a recurring question in that class, I don't think we framed it this way, but I was thinking in these terms is how do Christians relate to Western culture, right? A culture in which sports is hugely important as a part of the economy, as defining uh, relationships and loyalties. Uh, I mean, 60% of the students in that class when we pulled them are varsity athletes at Bethel. Like it's a big part of who they are as people. So there's that who am I, who should I be question. And so it was, I think, really useful to have them um, step back and think about that a little bit more critically. Like what do sports ask of us in terms of, uh, we talk about sports as a kind of religion itself, uh, one that you know, sometimes goes hand in hand with what Christian churches and individuals are trying to do, but sometimes it's competing. And we talked about what it's like when youth sports starts uh, functioning on Sundays or on Wednesdays and the kind of hard choices that puts parents and kids into. But also just the sense that in a way there is something kind of worshipful about sports. And uh, you know, is that a kind of idolatry? Is it elevating virtues that are maybe not Christian virtues like competition or we talked about violence in different sports. Um, and we talked a lot because it was also a political science class about things like public policy. We talked about like the kind of debates cities have about where do you put scarce funding when a team is threatening to leave and take jobs away in order to get half a billion dollars for a new stadium. And I think those are really pressing issues as citizens we need to be wrestling with. So it just felt like I really appreciate that our Gen Ed curriculum is built in this way. You start with this one kind of common experience of CWC because these are not questions we're used to asking of ourselves. And we often don't have the context for it or the tools for it. But then you build on that with something like an L course. But Amy, you also build on that if you're a student with something like a U course, which is our world cultures category. And that's a uh, category I know you teach in. So same question to you, how do U courses like your history of Islam course build on CWC and uh, why do you like teaching them? Yeah, well, um, history of Islam is a um, is a useful one to I think really talk about what is the U course, what's the value, what's the purpose, what's the intention. I mean, as students should know, as we are studying the development of Western culture, we're trying to even though that is like the the. the I love my cruise ship analogies. That's the cruise tour we're on. We look out across the boat and we're like, oh, but look, look over there. Look, we can see Africa. Like what is happening? What is, you know, taking place um, in um, nearby cultures and cultures as they interact with each other and the development of the Islamic empire is one of those. Um, and so um, my history of Islam course as a U course, this world cultures credit is kind of like a, well, what's happening on a different cruise, you know, itinerary, like what is happening um, in different places at the same time um, as the story that we're telling in CWC. And then when we get to the 19th century, cultures aren't isolated anymore. I mean, we're starting to see these interactions, whether it's through conquest, um, unfortunately, colonization, whether it's through exploration um, on either side, trade, all of these various different things. Um, to me, world, the world cultures category is like an initial, it's like an initial visit to um, another culture. It's a 200 level class. So we're not doing sort of higher level um, comparative analysis or sort of um, thinking about like systematizing or problematizing, but we're really just saying what's happening in um, other cultures that we may not be as familiar with, especially from like our high school curriculums and um, what's there to be appreciated, what's there to be learned, what's there to um, challenge us as we do think about like how that maybe relates to um, our the, the culture that's dominant or the one that we um, you know are living in in our context in the United States. What I really like though is that world cultures classes give you the opportunity to, um, as, as best I think professors can, how do we hear the voices of those we, we, we typically actually don't get to hear when we just sort of think about history on a global level. Um, and so what I love is that like in a class like History of Islam, students get to hear um, from important figures in history that they may have never had any familiarity with, but they also get a contemporary opportunity to hear from voices in the community because we try to bring in like um, local Muslims from here in our community and, and, and not just like experts, um, but rather like normal people, like people who are um, just members of our community who are dentists and teachers and um, 
you know, like IT consultants who are like, I'm, I'm Muslim. This is part of my heritage. Um, this is who I am. Um, and that affects every part of how I do my life. And let me tell you a little bit about that. And I think that's a particularly important opportunity for students because as awesome as it is that we are at a um, Christian university and that we come together around a shared type of, I mean, many manifestations of Christian identity, but like a shared commitment that we want to embrace and explore like Christian identity individually and communally, it does mean that there are voices that aren't in our spaces and aren't in our classrooms. And so um, I think that that's an essential part. And um, what I what I particularly love, and I'll end on this, is that um, being a history professor, I mean, everybody privileges their own discipline is thinking their own discipline is really important and essential to human development. But there's actually something really powerful about when a person who is either um, they're 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 a minority for whatever the description may be, and and at times have been marginalized. When they come into a space that is like maybe the dominant culture, but people know something about their history. And um, that's a really um, interesting and I think meaningful starting point when, when, a, when a person who's Muslim can come into a classroom at Bethel and they begin talking about Islam and then students begin sharing things. And then the, the speaker themselves is like, thank you for knowing about me. Thank you for, for having sort of, gosh, you might even know things that I don't know because I haven't studied my history. And um, that is to me just like a really, a really powerful thing that can happen in our space that kind of flips the dynamic of what was maybe something where we were at a certain type of disadvantage, but how can we actually acknowledge it and then um, do something with it that can be meaningful. So gosh, love that you category. We really need to like hold on to it. And so students, if you haven't taken your U yet, we have a lot of awesome ones. So I hope that you can find one that's great. So, well, we are now students, you, the three of us near the end of summer CWC, all that's left is tomorrow's um, exam. And then what we like to call the exit interview, final words of advice, Sam, if we... Is yeah, it back I, into port? Yeah, I would I say. Can I jump in? I wrote oh, the yeah. script for this. It's actually Monday's exam. Oh, it's oh, Monday's Monday. exam. Students, yeah, you don't have a test sorry. on Saturday. Sorry about that. I just, I, uh, you know, students, I do not go off the script. That is, that is Chris, Chris authors it. It's sacred. Yeah. <laughs> So I would say, I'm not going to say a lot about the exam. The exam is going to look like the other ones we've had. You know how to prepare. I feel like the last two exams have gone really pretty well. So I want to focus a little bit more on the exit interview. My first piece of advice is you're going to take this exam Monday. And then you're going to have this sense of like, okay, I just want to get this class done. You're going to have a little voice in your head. I would say silence that voice. Take a little break. Take a breath. Um, maybe take a day off from CWC, then go look at the exit interview, read the questions first, open it up, read the questions so you know, okay, here's the things I need to think about. Watch the last film. A lot of those, the, some of the questions in the exit interview are going to reflect directly on that. It's also going to be a lot of profs reflecting on the project that we've just been on. Uh, and then give yourself time, you know, maybe jot down some notes for each of the question. Here's things I think I want to talk about. Basically, take your time with this. This is not, this is a reflective writing assignment in lots and lots of ways. Um, so it's going to benefit you more if you give yourself some time to really think about those questions. Don't try to, in one sitting, just burn through all the answers and get it done. But 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 take some time because you have until is it the is it uh, Chris since you're our script writer it's the end of the week right that they haven't to, to finish this uh, or I Thursday? think it's the third Thursday episode, not yeah. quite the end of the week yeah yeah um, so you have some time you don't have to get this done done right away so take your time with it uh, be thoughtful about your answers and like with everything um, if you're gonna talk about something we we did in this course like go make specific references get that reading packet out throw a quote in there and and really start to dive into that quote I will say the students that I've graded you guys have done a great job of really using the text and that's what we're going to be looking for in this as well any other thoughts on the exit interview I'm um, just that uh, the kind of writing you're doing should be pretty familiar I mean these are basically like five response questions and we just give you a long time to think about them so uh, like I don't think you need to come up with a new way of doing writing you should you've been practicing in a sense this whole five weeks so I, I think really it's uh you know it's actually it's it's a lot of fun to read these because this is a lot of them are fairly individual kind of questions you know it's not just summary of a reading or but like a lot of them are really getting at where do you find yourself in the story what do you think about these issues that we've been talking about and so it's it's you know, having gone on this journey for five weeks and getting to know students a little bit better it's this it really is a nice kind of exit from the course for us hopefully as well as for you students 
Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, I mean, we, we say this, but just like really do take your time with it. Um, you know, we don't call it like a final essay, but in some respects, that's what it is. Um, and so take your time with it. Um, don't try to rush through it. You know, it's, I mean, I think it actually can be a very enjoyable exercise. I know nobody wants to hear that. Probably. Yeah, I'm excited to read them. I'm also excited because in segment two, uh, Dr. Gerritz and I are going to face off um, in one last round of food chain to talk about the mo five most important figures from unit three. We will be right back. <laughs> All right, welcome back to segment two. This is the last of our seven games. Sam, I have not been keeping track at all. Who's winning? Right? Well, is, anyone, is that the what we're doing? Here's the thing. The reason you haven't heard score updates is because I can tell you who's not winning. It's this guy. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> okay, well, that's kind of you to say. Well, we're going to play one more game just to settle this, at least for pride between the two of us, or maybe to help students review before Monday's test. We're going to play Food Chain one more time. Students, if you've forgotten, we usually end the unit by doing this. We go through basically all the mastery terms, maybe plus a couple of more that we just find interesting. And we have made a list of what we think of as the five most significant figures in the history of Christianity and Western culture from the unit. So in this case, from the scientific revolution all the way up through World War I. So at least through yeah, like some 19th century figures, maybe a little bit into the early 20th century. Uh, Sam, you wanna go first? What, what is your fifth most significant figure from unit yeah. three? Um, so I, as I was thinking about this list, there's, we've been talking so much about how the world we live in is shaped by, well, it's shaped by this whole story we've been telling, but it's so, it, there's such a, we're such direct children of some of these ideas. Um, so I, as I was thinking about my list, I was thinking about sort of where, where can I locate some of those really big, important ideas? So number five on my list, I'm going to put Adam Smith. Now, arguably Adam Smith could be much higher. I've seen, you do versions of this list where he's one or two. Uh, we did this over interim where we had students doing the list and Adam Smith was very high for some of them. So I want to have him on the list. Um, but uh, also as I was building it, it was one where I, I questioned, do I want to have or not? But the reason Adam Smith is on there is because um, especially living in the West, but especially living in America uh, in the 20th, 21st century, um, the ideas of market capitalism so shape not just the world we live in, but actually almost everybody I'm talking about here not only shape the world we live in, but they almost help to create the shape of our brains. The way our brains are wired is to think in certain categories. Um, and, you know, Smith and his ideas, like I said, they, they, they are crucial to, um, I think, scientific innovation, to, the, to industrialization, to like finding ways to fund and motivate that, you know, through market capitalism, but it also creates um, huge inequalities. If you've studied the, the, you know, when you look at the industrial revolution, right, this is part of laissez-faire capitalism as well as it creates these huge gaps between, um, between wealth and poverty, which shape the world that we live in. Um, and I just think he's he's unbelievably important. And I think I want to make the distinction between importance and like, these are these are people who are great, whose ideas I think are necessarily the greatest ideas in the world. But I do think um, I think you can look at a lot of the 20th century as shaped by sort of competing views of economics and uh, and uh, economic ideology. If you're looking at sort of you know Soviet Marxism and market capitalism, right? That that shapes the 20th. And 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 Smith is a big piece of that. So he's number five on my list. Chris, who do you have at number five? Uh, I'll come back to economics later on. I, I think I take your point about Adam Smith. And I, I think we have a similar approach to making this list. I'm, again, trying to think about, like, as we see ourselves more clearly, where are we seeing aspects of ourselves as individuals, as Americans, as people of the West? So I'm going to start with uh, John Wesley. I feel like one thing that's very easy to do at this point in the unit is to think that this is purely a story of secularization now. Uh, this is a story of where Christianity is losing its privileged position in Western culture, in American society. And you know that is a part of the story. I'll come back to that with someone else later. But I mean, really, the, the American story is one in which the, the Enlightenment shapes us, but also the Great Awakenings shape us. And evangelicalism, for better and for worse, shapes us. And so there are a lot of people we could talk about here. I was tempted to put George Whitfield because there's a debate about some of his statues because he was also a slaveholder in addition to being a revivalist. I think Wesley is a pretty significant figure to put on here. Um, but he really is 
taking in some of the pietist ideas about conversion, sanctification, the need for Christians to be actively engaged in the world, in missions and evangelism, but also social reform, personal holiness, and then really taking and translate into English. So for us, you know, as the West becomes an English speaking kind of place, Wesley is a hugely important figure. So he kind of stands in for me for a lot of other religious movements, but it, he really is important. Methodism is probably the most active Protestant tradition in America through the 19th century in terms of bringing preaching to the frontier, uh, inaugurating a lot of traditions about revival meetings, about what preaching is gonna look like, but also founding dozens, if not hundreds of colleges and universities coming out of this tradition as well. So I think as a nod to the fact that Christianity doesn't go away, that some of these themes of conversion and revival don't go away, I'm gonna put Wesley just to make sure we don't forget about him. Who's number four for you, Sam? Well, Chris, you are just mowing my lawn for me. Um, <laughs> Wesley's number four for me. Uh, and that's a bummer because you enjoy mowing your lawn. That's so. right, <laughs> that's right. Sorry about that. um, I will I will agree with everything you said. I think he is so unbelievably important to American Christianity for someone who was failed as a missionary to the American colonies. Methodism, and he really didn't like the American Revolution either. Right, right. Yeah. But Methodism shapes frontier Christianity. It's the way that um, that you see Christianity in some ways maintained and spread on the American frontiers through people like Methodists, like Francis Asbury, people like that who are coming out of um, out of Wesley's tradition. I think the the significance of revivals in the during the Age of Enlightenment, during the I mean, England is already in the 1700s in their Industrial Revolution, and he's he's helping to think about how do you do religious revival to people who are working. Oh, who are basically only working and sleeping, right? And he's and he's pushing the need for religious revival and 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 reform in that way. So I think Wesley, I won't say anymore because you everything you said was great, but I think he's unbelievably important, and I and I have to have him on this list. So who do you have at number four? So I think earlier in the webisode I used the phrase the American story, and um, one of my favorite books I've read the last couple of years is by a, a Harvard historian named Jill Lepore. She wanted to write like a single volume, just history of the United States. And uh, like for any historian, the question of where you start is really important. And like for some of us, we think the story starts in 1776 or 1787 with those political documents. Uh, recently, like one way of doing this is 1619, slavery coming to Jamestown. Maybe that's the start of the American story. She started in 1492 with Columbus. And I think that's really important that we now recognize that the story of the West and the story of America includes Latin America. That really the, the first encounter here is in places like the Caribbean and in Mexico and in silver mines in places like Peru and Bolivia. And so I'm gonna put Bartolome de las Casas here as a reminder that Christians are active, not just eyewitnesses to this, but participants in this, both um, abetting slavery and genocide, but also critiquing it and trying to stop it. Um, I, like, I wanna put someone like Frederick Douglass here. I, I wanna put someone like Sojourner Truth here. I, I wish we had more indigenous Christian voice to put in here. And so again, kind of as a placeholder for lots of other people, I think we need to acknowledge the part of the story here is that Western culture often comes in the baggage of empire and Christianity comes alongside exploitation and violence and oppression. And like Las Casas is a pretty um, bracing reading from the mid 16th century in the middle of the reformation to get this Christian missionary bearing witness to the savagery of Christians and the um, brutality of these supposedly civilized Westerners as they come to Central America and the Caribbean. So I, I think he's an important figure and most I just wanna make sure we didn't overlook him because it's always hard for us to know where to tell that story in the midst of the rest of our story. So if you didn't read Las Casas, go back and read Las Casas. Sam, who's number three? My number three is actually right in line with that. And it's not one of the people you mentioned, but it's somebody who's in a, a version of that story. And that's why I'm putting Aluda Equiano um, for, for some of the reasons that you mentioned. As I'm looking at my list, I realize everything is in the uh, the British Isles for my, my choices. But but I think be, these are things meant to represent much, uh, much bigger impacts. Um, uh, Equiano is the... the um, narrative of his life that he writes, the autobiography that he, of the, his, his life that he writes is crucial for changing um, the hearts and minds of people in England, which is going to lead to the end of the slave trade in England. Um, I mean that he's, he's unmasking the, the sort of dark darkness that 
lies underneath their system. So if we think about Adam Smith helping to fuel, you know, this this industrial revolution, all this stuff, and Equiano saying, yeah, but if you look at the if you look at the prosperity of England, prosperity of the West, look at what's underneath it. Mm-hmm. So he's there. To, I I really I also thought about Frederick Douglass here. I thought about Sojourner Truth here. Those were the three I thought about, and I think, you know, partially. If you are uh, an American student and you went through, you took uh, American history in high school, I presume you've encountered Frederick Douglass. I hope. I presume you've encountered Sojourner Truth. I hope. Equiano is not a name that we necessarily always hear because he's he's really crucial in the English context. But in American history, like that's not where his story necessarily is, is, is focused. So I wanted to have a version of that story of the West and colonization and slavery. Um, and and as somebody who doesn't just speak out against it, but is an active piece in fundamentally working to change things. So Equiano is my number three. Who do you have at number three? Um, so you mentioned Adam Smith earlier and the fact that I've sometimes put him very near the top list. I, I decided to throw you a, a curveball here, baseball reference, uh, and put Karl Marx in as number three. <laughs> <laughs> so here too, I feel like it'd be easy to have Marx kind of slip through the cracks. I mean, you've got a reading from him. He's a mastery term. He's in the museum. But, you know, that's the 19th century. It's a little beyond our, our pale. But because I'm thinking about teaching my Cold War class next fall, I've been thinking a lot about The Shadow Cast by Karl Marx. And, like, when I first started teaching Cold War classes, I mean, it felt like, well, Marxism had been defeated, right? Like, Soviet Union fell apart. Communism collapsed everywhere except places like North Korea. Um, even the Chinese were capitalists, right? I think the more distance we get from the Cold War, we more we realize how significant Marx is as a figure coming off the Enlightenment, sharing its values in some ways, but also critiquing it and breaking with it. So just a couple of examples. First of all, I mentioned secularization earlier. This is one of the defining features of the Western experience, and Karl Marx is a pretty significant example. You know, Karl Marx, when he was in high school, wrote an essay about Jesus. Uh, he came from a Jewish tradition that converted to Christianity, but he came to see religion as this kind of sedative. I mean, this kind of drug that masks the pain of the kind of industrialization that you talked about with John Wesley's hardworking Englishman. Um, and that's obviously I don't share that, but I think that's an important critique for us. Is religion just something we do to kind of help push our attention away from the problems of this world? Like that's that's a real challenge for every Christian. In the Cold War class, I have students read Martin Luther King Jr. He preached a sermon in 1962 asking whether Christians can be communists. And he says no, but they should learn from communists to concern themselves with social justice and the problems of this world. Second, Marx really has this enlightenment notion that history is a working out of natural laws. Uh, And he borrows this in a way from Adam Smith. But his notion is that the, the law here is class conflict. And that everything else probably goes back to economic, who owns property, who owns land, who owns the means of production, who decides what people are paid, who gets wealthy. And that generates a lot of conflict. And you can explain all of history in those ways. And so it doesn't seem like he's a very Smithian kind of figure, but he's doing the same kind of historical and economic analysis. But it leads him then to a very unenlightenment sort of conclusion, which is the only way that change can endure is through violent revolution. And I think in some ways that's something we're wrestling with right now. Like are moderate solutions anything other than window dressing in deep-seated problems of inequality, of exploitation? Um, Why have we not eradicated poverty this far from the Enlightenment? Why have we not eradicated racism this far? Is it because we have not been prepared to face up to the need for revolutionary change? And I don't like Marx's solution to this, but I think, again, that's something we need to grapple with. Are are there ways in which the only way we can change Western culture is to overturn Western culture to make it more just? That's a challenge we all face. Okay, Sam, number two for you. I have a feeling uh, there's a good chance that uh, one and two for us are the same because there's two big figures we haven't talked about yet. So I'm not certain what your list looks like, but uh, number two on my list is John Locke. Um, and you know, you were, you're talking about revolutionary change. Locke is a, is a big figure in the enlightenment's embrace, uh, to a degree of revolution. Um, you know, one of the things interesting when students write about John Locke, they very often will talk about John Locke and natural rights, life, liberty, and property. And his argument for like, okay, governments are based on the consent of the governed and state of nature. We give up some of the, that absolute freedom in order to form a commonwealth, to have our rights protected. 
But sometimes they don't take that next step, which is one of the big ideas for Locke is that Locke says, if the government isn't this sacred thing that, you know, is established by God, the way a medieval person or Martin Luther would say, if it is this thing that is based on the consent of the governed, it's a human creation. Then Locke says, if the government ceases to fulfill its purpose to protect natural rights, then he says, what you should do is tear it down and build a better one because it's just a human creation. So Locke gives a rational enlightenment justification for political revolution. And what's interesting about Locke is it's, this isn't something that's just in theory. He's talking about the glorious revolution, sort of making the case for why this happened and why that's okay. But it's also becomes the fuel for the revolutions that are going to come in the next century. The American Revolution is so deeply dependent on Locke's thinking. Um, the French Revolution, it's a little more complicated, but there still is this sort of enlightenment revolution, enlightenment social contract view of government. And I think um, living in America in 2020 even, it is still like to understand John Locke is helps to understand American history, helps to understand American government, um, even though there's been you know, hundreds of years of layers put onto that and complexities put onto that is that the, again, I said, when I talked about Smith, that these folks that we're talking about here, like help to shape our brain. I think Locke helps to shape our political brain um, and helps to shape the political brain in the West in lots and lots of ways. So I'm going to almost as if our brains were a tabula rasa. Um, I'm, so I'm going to put Locke at number two on my list. Chris, who do you have? You know, that is a very tempting choice, but uh, in honor of an anniversary, I'm going to say is someone who fixes, helps fix something Locke oversaw, which is Locke believes in these natural rights. Um, he's not prepared to give them to certain peoples, uh, indigenous persons, uh, Africans who are all in slavery, and certainly not women. And next month is the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote in this country. And so in honor of that, but it, I think I'd say this even if that weren't the case, I'm going to put Mary Wollstonecraft number two. If we want to think about why our society uh, is, is why we can recognize ourselves, this is a signal event that you have a woman in the end of the 1700s using the Enlightenment itself to critique the West. And ask the question Amy was pointing out in the first segment, why don't we have access? Why are we not allowed into the world of politics, even as a voter? You know, something that we just think of as a relatively token act, let alone holding office. Why aren't we allowed into the world of law or of business? You know, women are not allowed into Adam Smith's world of accumulating wealth, of, of being captains of industry. And maybe most importantly, and the one that I'd have students think most about, they're not allowed into any of those places because they don't have access to education, which uh, has to do with like social prestige in England in the late 18th century, but also obviously to knowledge and to skill acquisition. All the things we promise you in a Bethel education, women are precluded from until people like Mary Wollstonecraft start the very long, hard work of overturning those assumptions that women don't belong in a public sphere, that women don't need that kind of education, that women don't need the vote because their husbands can vote. All those things that we just regard as it's impossible people believe them. It took over a century to get the mainstream to overturn those ideas and it had to start with Wollstonecraft. So like, there's a part of me that wants to say, well, but another in her lifetime came of this, right? But you've got to start somewhere. And she is, I think, by far the most important figure in the Western story of women achieving these rights. Um, and so like, I think it does depend on Locke in a sense that to even believe natural rights are something we should strive for, to believe that there might need to be revolutionary change. But he was not able to see this part. And it took people like Wollstonecraft to point out the limits to his vision and then to bring into relief a society where Women do have the right to vote. Women do serve in office. Women do control companies. And 60% of Bethel students are women. All but two of my students are women. And it's because of a woman like Mary Wollstonecraft that that's possible. Sam, I'm pretty sure I know who our number one choice is. In I'm going to think... actually defer to you because I talked about him last week. So I'm going to let you gonna say, I, Yeah, so I think we both have Isaac Newton as number one. If I can read Sam's mind right now, and I think I can after all these years. Um, so last time, Sam gave, made the case that Newton is by far the most important figure, apart from, say, Jesus, uh, in this class. And I was put in the position of arguing against that. Here, I feel like I just want to say, go back and watch what Sam said last time, because he's absolutely right. The way we think, to use your idea of our brains have been hardwired, we are all Newtonians. 
we like, I mean, I think as Christians, we think maybe it doesn't explain everything. You know, there are other kinds of questions here. Miracles are possible. There's a world beyond the physical and material. But in terms of most of what we spend our time doing and contemplating and trying to understand, we approach it as Newton would have us approach it. That there's some kind, <clears throat> let's call it a law. There's some kind of universal principle that maybe we don't understand, but it's accessible to reason. You know, whether that's a kind of imaginative exercise or an empirical uh, process, they might include experimentation and analysis. We assume that if we work, if we think hard enough and maybe we talk to each other and we test a hypothesis, we will get to an emerging, deepening sense of what that principle is. And then, as importantly, we can harness that principle, whether it's a principle of physics and we can build, uh, we can apply it to engineering, like happens all the time on AC second floor at Bethel, or in the world of politics, like John Locke. If we just think through why do we have governments, why do we have social institutions, we can improve them. Or Adam Smith, if we just come to a better sense of what drives economic processes, we can optimize them and achieve greater prosperity and maybe even greater economic equality. Those are all Newton Newtonian assumptions or Newtonian extrapolations. And it's just so hard for us to think in other sorts of ways. Like, I think there's also a deeply irrational part of us too. But I think we like to think of ourselves like, at our best, we are being rational, thoughtful, scientific creatures who are using this kind of method in order to improve our lives. This is the scientific revolution, this is the enlightenment, and this is the legacy of Isaac Newton. And I don't think it's all explaining, but it's awfully powerful even all these centuries later. I don't know, Sam, well, if there's anything you want to add to that. Man, if I had a hat on, I would take my hat off to that. That would be great. <laughs> no, that, I mean, that, that's exactly right. I think I think he's, and again, it doesn't mean that I think he's the 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 greatest or anything like this, but I think I think it we can't it, it's it's sort of like we can't see the air we're breathing. We can't like this is just how we understand the world. Um the, the physical world. And I think that's, you know, that's unbelievably important. Uh, Chris, uh, this was our last round of this. If students want to go on to uh, Moodle, you can vote to see which list you think is best. Um, they're the exact same at the top, but the rest of that list is very different. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if anybody else does, but I love to go in and look at the student voting and sort of um, sort of see what students have to say about this. Um, we will be back in segment three to wrap up the show and to wrap up the season. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome back for our final segment of Happy Happy Time. And it makes me kind of sad, sad a little bit. Um, but happy birthday to Michael Richards. This is crazy to me, but Kramer from Seinfeld is 71 years old today. Hey, kids, Seinfeld's a show we used to watch when we were your age. Um, Seinfeld itself turned 31 this month, which is crazy to me. Sam, how do you feel like it holds up? I think it holds up pretty well. I mean, it's a it's a multicam sitcom. It's still probably, in my mind, the the apex of the the multicam sitcom. You know, where you're on a set, studio audience, things like that. Um, I still think it has worked its way into our cultural lexicon. And even though it hasn't been on for 22 years, I think like I still think you constantly see references to it. Although those references are starting, the references themselves aren't like. Like they haven't necessarily aged poorly, but they, it does sort of feel dated to make Seinfeld references. Yeah. But I actually still think if you go back and watch the show, it's still it's still very, very, very funny. It's it's hard for us because it was so ubiquitous in the late 90s, first decade of the 20th century. Um, it's been a while since I've seen a Seinfeld episode. Mm -hmm. And after hearing this now, I kind of want to go back and, and watch a little bit of Seinfeld. Um, happy anniversary to the Kellogg Briand pack. The treaty that was supposed to ban war went into effect on this day in 1929. 1929, Chris, how did that work out? Well, uh, so not great. Uh, everyone who signed it ended up going to war with someone else who signed it. But I, I, I'm glad it's here for a couple reasons. Number one, I'm a big Minnesota booster. Uh, if you ever go into a wild game, you drive on Kellogg, which is named after Frank Kellogg, the Minnesotan senator who became Secretary of State. I wrote my undergraduate thesis about Aristide Briand, the French uh, foreign minister. So I've got a soft spot for these two. Didn't we all? I think it's a good thing to mention because this is such a good example of like enlightenment thinking that in the wake of World War One, we can kind of 
rationally come up with peaceful resolution that we can outgrow war. Like if you need some evidence that the Enlightenment was still shaping aspirations in the 20th century, the Kellogg-Briand Pact is a pretty good example of it. Um, and of course, four years later, Hitler became dictator of Germany and uh, yada, yada, yada. Happy trails to the summer 2020 term of CWC. Amy, what a long, strange trip it's been. Any favorite memories? I know you like making scrapbooks, uh, figuratively or maybe literally of things. Yeah, no, this is very true. Um, this has been a this has been such a weird one, you know. I mean, usually we get to film these webisodes together, mm -hmm. um, uh, which lends them a certain. Chris, you are a French person. A joie de vivre. How do you say that? Did you say quoi? Oh no, joie de vivre. No, no, like the the, jo the joie de vivre. The <laughs> whatever. <laughs> like, but. Uh, no, I mean, like, this has been, um, we, students, you don't really get to know this because we don't usually talk about it in front of you, but, like, you've been a really good group of students. Like, we've just had really strong um, students academically who've just really kind of engaged in the material, and um, that's been really, that's been really um, great because as a professor, it's like nothing's better than when you feel like students are um, bringing themselves into the material and talking about some of your life experiences, and so, um that's something that I um, really appreciated. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I will look forward to having another summer CWC where we get to talk about like the Olympics and <laughs> like um, and 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 having a debate about me not caring about the state fair because I'm gonna have to go. Uh, so yeah, so we're just gonna, you know, I'm gonna again, I'm gonna I'm gonna say like we survived this one, so that's a that's a good thing, and I think we did our best. So yeah, but that's. Wow, that's it. Um, any any sort of final final reminders about like the third exam, the exit interview? I guess maybe I'm just supposed to remind you about those. <laughs> but um, we've got these things coming up left. But Chris and Sam, I want to make sure you also get a last word. So yeah, you I, I would say, as Amy said, you know, one of the other things that's always hard about teaching online is, and Flipgrid has been helpful for us to sort of see you, but like we don't really get to know you. But remember, we're all at the same school. So as long as we're appropriately distanced and all those things, come by and say hi this fall. I would love to meet the people who are in this class. Yes. And you just made your office social distance friendly. I did, yes. Yep. That's so. true. And they, they just cleaned our office spaces, Amy. They're, they did the deep cleaning this week. So we're very sanitary up on CC oh. fourth floor. And that, that's my entree to say, like, students, you know, some of you are actually near the end of your Bethel career. Most of you, though, are pretty early on. Let me make a pitch that if you enjoyed any aspect of this, really do put some thought into maybe using your gen ed classes to explore things like history, philosophy, theology, literature more. Uh, like we, we don't expect that most Bethel students are going to major in those fields in the 21st century, but there's definitely room to be adding those courses, whether it's gen ed or electives. Certainly think about a minor uh, and even a double major. Like they generally work like we have. You probably don't want to these questions. It wouldn't be the end of CWC if we didn't have a little bit of a tech glitch, but man, we made it all the way till now. So um, students, that just reminds you we're real. We're real people. <laughs> <laughs> and we know how to we know how to roll with it. So um, you know, from well, I like 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 from our homes to yours, but Sam, I will let you close this out because you know exactly what we're supposed to say. <laughs> All right. Uh it's been a great summer. Uh do a good job in your exit interview and enjoy the last month before the fall semester starts. Uh and until then, say goodnight, Stacey. <laughs>